are you? Good, good. So Chip is going to be teaching us um, intermittent fasting and some dietary changes. Um, Chip, I am, you blow me away at these in your preparation. So I'm just going to take a step back and let you run this and I will listen and check in. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Okay. Well, first of, first of all, I, I, you know, again, as I said earlier, it's an honor to, to be asked to do this. And um, it's just a, this is a really neat thing. This is a thing that I'm sure we will expand on and build on. Um, but Jamie, you've done a wonderful job with this. And again, thanks to Jim Gerstner, who's kind of, you know, the man, man behind the curtain. So the man that kind of makes it all happen. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about intermittent fasting. Uh, but again, if you if you caught my earlier one, we're going to recap a little bit because in order to talk about intermittent fasting, we really need to understand a little bit about how we work. So again, if I like to say we want to we want to kind of sail with the wind r rather than fight the wind. And um, so as we understand how our bodies work. We can kind of supplement <laughs> into that and we can also behave into that and kind of go with the wind and the way that, you know, our bodies are kind of wanting to work. So the most important thing in that discussion is to understand that you run on a bunch of clocks and those clocks are super important to your body because your body isn't real good at doing everything at once. So it's not it doesn't work in a chaotic and confusing manner. It works in a very logical and predictable manner. So as we go through the day, basically, as we go through 24 hours, our body is doing certain things at certain times. So like in the evening, we do a lot of cellular repair. We do a lot of, um, you know, our body's really focused on repair and kind of, you know, repairing tissue and things like that. During the day, our body's more focused on energy needs and on hormones, things like that. So best example of this is if I give you melatonin, let's say I give you melatonin at noon. Well, that melatonin, you're going to take it, you're going to absorb it, it's going to get into your blood, but you're not going to have any genes expressed. You're not going to have any melatonin receptors open to receive that melatonin at noon. So it's going to do absolutely nothing for you. If I give you that same dose of melatonin at 8 p.m. at night, Again, you're going to absorb it. It's going to get into your blood. It's going to be circulating. Now you've got open receptors. It's going to affect you. But that works because our bodies want to go through this process every day that's very logical and very predictable. Now, the reason I have that circled is the act of eating plus the makeup of diet greatly impact the health status of the individual. So the most disruptive thing that we sort of do to this beautiful godly symphony that our bodies want to perform every day is that we eat, okay? So when we eat, we need to understand the impact of that, and we need to understand, basically, we need to be more intentional, definitely, about what we're putting in our body, and we'll talk about that at the very end, but I want to just talk you through this concept of just eating and how disruptive this is. So if your body's trying to heal from cancer, when you eat, you are taking resources away from your body's ability to heal your cancer. And that's the most important message I can give you in this context, okay? So I need to give you some, some again, some more background. So there's something that everyone should literally, we should be taught this in grade school. It's, you know, anyone can learn this. It's not a very difficult concept, but something called fasting and fed. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that when we eat, again, because it's disruptive to this process, we put our body in a special state. And again, when we're focused on what we just consumed and on breaking that down and storing that in triglycerides and understanding the fats that are there, it's very complicated, right? To do takes a lot of work. Well, something suffers. And guess what suffers? Your immune system suffers. So we eat at the expense, and we, well, we deal with the nutrients, let's say, that we just ate at the expense of our immune system, okay? So how does this work? Well, when we eat for five hours, literally every cell in your body will flip and start running on glucose. Now, cancer cells won't. They're always stuck over here in the Warburg effect, but every other cell in your body will go over here and start running on glucose. And that needs to happen because you're dealing with and managing with fats. So your, 
your preferred fuel is fatty acids while you're here on this earth. You can run on light, which is a whole nother conversation and a deep rabbit hole. But for right now, our preferred fuel is fats, right? So again, when we eat, click, we click over into the glucose mode and all of our mitochondria start, or most of our mitochondria start running on glucose, all right? And we're storing fat for five hours after we eat. We're dealing with all these fats. This says three hours, so three to five hours, but for five hours ish, we're dealing with all of this, you know, stuff that we did and we're running on glucose. Five hours after we eat, click, we switch and all of our cells start running on fats or for the most part, the mac your macro starts running on fats, which is great. So by the way, when you eat and for five hours after you eat, you can't lose any weight. You're storing fat, okay? You're storing fat. You're not burning fat. You don't burn fat until you go into this fat burning mode and it takes five hours after you eat. Now, one quick thing to look at this is, you know, what happens 36 to 48 hours after our last meal? And that's when we enter this, you know, very preferred metabolic state. So, you know, why we work this way, I, I don't know, but it, God designed us this way. So it's almost like the more stress we have, kind of the more healthy we get, you know, the longer we don't eat, kind of we go into this super healthy state, which is interesting. So how we play that balance um, is important, going to be important for the future. It's going to be important for how, you know, we, you know, transmit kind of this knowledge onto our kids for future health. All right. So what are the types of fats that we should eat and what should we not eat? Well, vegetable oil and most of the cooking oils that you cook with, unless you cook with a lot of olive oil, olive oil is the best thing to cook with. Um, but canola, stuff like that, those are things called trans fats or vegetable fats. Those are not preferred fats, okay? So what we want to eat are the fats that we can stick on our triglyceride. And those are saturated fats. And saturated fats are, you know, come in the form of meat generally or butter or coconut oil. Um, about of our fat diet, just of our fat diet, about 30% should be saturated. Right now, most of you guys are way, way, way above that. Um, monounsaturated fat, most of us don't have this in our diet very much. So it comes from nuts mainly, but you can get it in other sources. Again, we need to eat more of this. Probably 50% of our fat needs to be monounsaturated fat. Monounsaturated fat is super good. It's anti-inflammatory. You build an endocannabinoid from monounsaturated fat called oleomide. And oleomide is more important than any other endocannabinoid okay so super important and we just we don't eat enough monounsaturated fat you know we don't have enough oleomide we don't um you know manufacture that as much as we need to so the last types of fats are essential that means your body can't make them you've got to consume them and they are called the polyunsaturated fatty acids but omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids we need to eat these in balance. Right now, we don't. We eat 20 times more omega-6 than omega-3, and that is super unhealthy. It is poison, literally poison to us. So if you don't get anything else out of this talk, eat more omega-3s and watch your corn, watch all the omega-6s that are in your diet. Those need to be balanced, and the omegas should be you know, 10 to 20% of our fats, okay? but they should be in balance. We don't want to get more than one to four out of balance with omega-3 to omega-6. If we do, it, it makes us super unhealthy. It causes us to get fat. It causes us to not have good uh, signaling with our fat tissue, and that's super important. Omega-3 is super duper important to being able to manage our weight and kind of how our weight works. That's why bears eat so much fish, just saying. Okay. Um, the endocannabinoid system. So what role does this play in this? Well, as you go from eating to not eating, as you go from, let's say, running a marathon to not, as you, you know, get around lead or some horrible metal or, you know, environmentally, as you get too hot or too cold, all of that has to be managed. All of that has to be managed. So what manages all that inside of you? Well, something called the endocannabinoid system, which is really cool. And the way that the endocannabinoid system works or the way that it's sort of its top level, let's say, management function is as you eat dietary fats, the dietary fats you can stick on a triglyceride, 
basically as soon as they hit your intestinal lumen, they form endocannabinoids and those go right into your blood. As they go into your blood and as they affect the vagal afferent nerve, this giant nerve that you have that runs from your tummy all the way to your hypothalamus hippocampus, information is communicated about what you just ate. And if you're getting the right kinds of fats, because again, you are a big fat machine. It's all about fats for us. It doesn't have anything to do with sugars and carbohydrates are useful and useful in kind of what we do. And we got to have them to bind gases and all kinds of stuff. So we need them, but we run on fats. So your gas is fats, you know, the carbohydrates are kind of a cofactor that we need. Okay. So it's all about the fats. Again, your endocannabinoid system is all about the fats and your endocannabinoid system is all about how basically these fats, your understanding of these fats in your hypothalamus hippocampus. So if you're not getting the fats that you need and you're not getting them in the right ratios, and none of us are right now because we're all eating too much saturated fat and not enough mono, and we're all eating too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3. So what happens is our hypothalamus hippocampus goes, wow, we're not getting what we need. We've got to have a microbiome. And so whoop, you're allowed to basically have bacteria in your gut. This is controlled within reason by your endocannabinoid system. The purpose of those bacteria is to poop out useful proteins that you use to offset nutrients that you're not getting in your diet from the fats you're not eating. So the worst case scenario in that is exactly what we do. If we eat a lot of saturated fat and a lot of omega-6, then we've got to have a whopping biome full of anti-inflammatory producing bacteria that produce a lot of short chain anti-inflammatory fatty acids that we have to use to offset what we're not getting in our diet. So not what we want to do, boys and girls. It's almost the worst case scenario right now as to our health. Yeah, figure that. Sure makes you a good business situation for um, the medical you know, profession, um, but it certainly is not in your best interest or your best health, and it's not ethical um, what happens at all. <clears throat> and we're all figuring that out, aren't we? All right. So what causes cancer? Um, well, you know, cell mutations, right? So, and, and, and it takes a fair bit of cell mutating in order for you to form cancer. I mean, so according to this graphic, it's, you know, on the fourth plus mutation. And at each instance, you have to have cell damage. So again, it, is this, you know, normal for a cell to mutate four times? I mean, is that, you know, God's plan? Is that how God designed you? I mean, God's not a poor engineer. God's the best engineer there could possibly be. I don't think he designed you this way. So you have to have a mechanism basically to kind of clean this up. I mean, nothing should ever get this bad. And it turns out that in God's brilliant engineering, you have a mechanism to clean up mutated cells. You have two mechanisms which will fight cancer just by yourself. You don't have to do anything except not eat, okay? So they turn off for five hours after you eat. You turn off your defenses for cancer. If you eat breakfast and then four hours and 45 minutes later, you eat lunch. And then four hours and 59 minutes later, you eat dinner. And then four hours later, you eat that snack right before you go to bed. You never have cancer defenses. Okay? I really want you guys to understand that, how important that is. You never have cancer defenses. The only way these defenses go up, five hours after you eat. Now, there's some things that you can do to supplement that can kind of force that. But again, it's just that's just the facts. So when I say blowing with the wind... Again, if you're eating a bunch of sugar and if you have cancer and you're eating a bunch of sugar and you're eating more than every five hours, it, I mean, I'm, you know, no one's going to be able to help you very much. Okay. If you're willing to fast intermittent fast in particular, intermittent fasting is pretty easy. Anyone can intermittent fast. It's not hard. It's, you know, you don't, you kind of train yourself not to get hungry. And we'll go talk about that more in a second. But if you can intermittent fast and you have cancer, well, now you're blowing with the wind. So now when you take your supplements five hours after you've eaten, you're pushing the same button about in six different ways. I mean, you're using God's principles and God's engineering and sort of God's system to heal your cancer, allow your body to heal your cancer. Okay. 
So that's what we want to do. Now, the this thing that I've got over on the right with the dinosaur stuff, it it that's just to illustrate a point. So if cancer is just about mutated cells, then a whale or an elephant should have way more cancer than a mouse or you because they have more cells. And it, it doesn't work that way because a whale and an elephant have several different genes which will express something called P53, which is your cancer killer. Again, which turns off for five hours after you eat, right? But they have more of these genes. We just have one, okay? So we need to be super concerned about, you know, the genetics there and about being able to push that P53 button. But everyone can push that P53 button. It's, you know, that's literally a high, high function of, of how you work. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about intermittent fasting. And I love using Holly the bear as an example. You know, no, bears don't work exactly like we do, but they pretty much work like we do. And, you know, we're, in my mind, we're a little bit more than a mammal. It, they do different things with vitamin D than we do. But anyway, we'll leave that for another, listen to chip talks. So, so we'll go, you can go over there and listen to that. And uh, there's lots of that over there. So, but it, it, it's super important if you have cancer or love someone with cancer that you intermittent fast. Okay. And, and, and the reason for this is just the very principles that I just went through. We want to spend as much time as possible past that last meal as we possibly can, because the longer that we go past that last meal, the more sort of stuff that begins turning on to help us fight cancer, okay? So let me talk to you about a bear, because we all understand that bears get fat, you know, and bears have to sort of get fat and hibernate. So how does that work? And does a bear control that? Well, yes, a bear controls that. And just like you can kind of control your weight with these same principles. So intermittent fasting also does this for you. But a bear, when a bear comes out of hibernation, a bear will only eat in a four hour window. Okay. A bear might eat a jillion calories. I mean, a bear might eat a truckload of fish in four hours. So it's not about the calories. It's about the frequency. It's kind of about, you know, what you're eating, but it's as far as weight gain, as far as pushing AMPK, it doesn't matter. It's all about frequency, okay? So frequency is more important than calories. You've been taught the exact opposite, but again, frequency is, as far as how you work, frequency is weight. God's engineering, frequency is way more important than calories, all right? So a bear will only eat for four hours, four hours all through the spring and all through the summer. Because that bear has to be like the bear on the left. That's Holly at the end of the summer. Holly is lean. Holly is mean. Holly is a fit bear. Holly is ready to move around. And bears have to be territorial. They have to move around to reproduce, you know, so that they have to be lean all through the spring and summer. But when the fall comes, they understand that they need to put on weight in order to hibernate. And so what they do is they just change their window. They just open the window up to 20 hours. About what you and I have right now, if we eat normally, is we eat in about a 20-hour window. So they start doing what we do. And guess what? They put on weight like crazy. They start gaining weight. And it doesn't matter how much they eat. They don't really change. They might eat a few more berries in the fall than they do in the you know spring. But it doesn't really, they don't really change what they, they just change their frequency. And they put on weight, Okay. So this is why intermittent fasting is so important. Again, we want to spend, if you eat, if you do like spring holly, and that's kind of what Cindy and I do, we eat in about a four hour window. Past that four hours, we got five hours of processing. So now we're at nine hours. That gives us 15 hours in an optimal state every day. That gives us 15 hours of cancer fighting every day, okay? So again, if I've got cancer, I want to have 15 hours of cancer fighting every day. That's blowing with the wind. I want that in addition to everything else that I'm doing. But again, this is just top level stuff and how your body works and how your body can heal itself. All right. Um, okay. So depending on the severity of your cancer, I just want to kind of give you this message. Um, if, 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 if you've been given, you know, weeks or months, um, then you need to hear this. And again, it's, this is going to be somewhat counterintuitive, but you need to immediately, uh, consider fasting. You need to do this with some guidance, but I want you to look at, again, in the graphic hours, 36 to 48, the second bullet metabolic shift, fatty acids and ketones as fuel. 
Well, guess what? Cancer doesn't eat ketones, okay? Cancer cannot eat 48 hours after you start a fast. It doesn't have any food, okay? Now, there's you know, some nuance to this, and we need to be careful with this, and I would not do this without guidance, um, but if you're, you know, have gotten the death sentence, this is a way to um, people fast through that and, and make it through that. I'll just put it that way, okay? So in the more severe, I would say, you know, your cancer is, the more you need to consider longer fasts over the intermittent fast. Anyone with cancer should look at intermittent fasting. Anyone with, in fact, everyone should be intermittent fasting right now. And I mean, freaking everyone. It is the biggest health tip I can give you. All right. So what's some nutritional bullshit that you'll hear out there? Well, these two things, look, I just pull up, you know, what do you do and don't with cancer? And so I just pulled up the do's. Always eat breakfast. N no, <laughs> don't eat breakfast. Eat five to six meals a day. No, that will kill you. And it just, it's amazing to me. Again, it just, su this supports a business model. So it's probably, oh, does Pfizer on here somewhere? Um yeah. So this is not what you need to do. And again, this is why, you know, why should you listen to me over people that produce this graphic? Well, I'm going to give you the studies and everything that I ran down to produce the data that I am. I'm happy to do that for you, you know, if you want me to do that. Okay. So what to eat and what not to eat. All right. So this is super important. We'll run through this real quick and then we'll get to questions if anybody has any questions. Um, so do not consume dietary sugars. These are basically, you're pouring gasoline on a fire, okay? So do you want to do that? Um, if you want to do that, go ahead. But again, when you're eating that cinnamon roll, that donut, um, high fructose corn syrup would go in this same category. You are fueling your cancer, okay? Um, I would avoid processed foods. It, Jennifer Hawkins will, with Hawkeye Consulting, will go, she'll do a lot better job of drilling into this processed foods. Uh, you know, if you can't pick it or shoot it, she'll say, then don't eat it. But we need to avoid processed foods, foods with dyes, preservatives, other chemicals. Again, if you can't grow it or pick it or shoot it, then don't eat it. Balance your fat intake, which will mean eating more omega-3 foods and more nuts, which contain monounsaturated fat. So again, if you have cancer, you need to be intentional about when you eat and you need to be intentional about what you eat. Avoid stressful situations and stress uh, situations that could cause environmental stress. So again, don't be around noxious fumes. Don't be around people who smoke. If you smoke, stop smoking. Um, you know, anything environmentally that's going to tweak you will make, this is a super good thing to do. And hopefully you guys are, you know, getting something out of this and enjoying this. It, this is, um, you know, the state of, let's say the, you know, cannabis expo and cannabis show and things like that, I think are going to move more to these more tailored and individual, um, type events, you know, where we're talking specifically to people who need to hear what we have to say and also can kind of bring the medicine that uh, potentially the folks need. So the, the start to a project into a, a bigger one. So one one thing I do want to say real quick while everybody's watching is that um, we are going to dare to do this more than an annual event. Um, we're going to shoot for quarterly for this. That way we can hear the best of, of the entire industry and what everybody has to say. Um, so, you know, you want to make big moves, you got to do drastic things. So if I've got to plan a Zoom event every four months, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on that. It's a, Hopefully you guys support this and then find this useful. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, Chip, as always, thank you. You always do a fantastic job at educating. Um, we appreciate you so much. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, um, Chip is part of what we're doing um, on a regular basis. So I have regular interactions with Chip and um, I get to learn a whole lot on a regular basis from him. And I truly appreciate everything that you do for Operation Zero and FICO Playbook. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yep, it's an honor and again, it, you know, I'm here to help. I mean, yep. so that's that's why I'm here, and you are too. So it's, that's what we're trying to do. So. Yep. The 11:30 with Dave Evans to hear his survivor story. Um, I hope you guys tune in. Thank you.
Bye-bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.